Today is June 5th, 2015. This interview with Al Pawlowski of Grand Rapids, Michigan is being conducted by Deb Moore of the Grand Valley State University Veterans History Project. Well, thanks for talking to me today, Al. Um, I'm afraid I'm going to have to go in front of the camera. There we go. Okay. Um, why don't we start out? I know you were in the Navy. Uh, why don't you tell me your name, rank, and serial number? Oh. My serial number is 3663 right? No, that's, that's my the other number. Oh, sorry to start with a hard one. <laughs> that's okay. It's like, like 863-49505 or something like that. Well, well it's, on, it's only been 60 years, so. It's on so we <laughs> 70 years. Sorry, I never asked anybody that in the beginning. Forget about that. Maybe they'll cut that part out. Um, why don't you tell me, uh, Al, about where and when you were born? I was born in Grand Rapids, Michigan, 1925 by Memorial Day, right across the street from St. Isidore's Church on Diamond. Okay, and tell me a little bit about your mom and your dad and your siblings. Well, my dad came here from uh, the old country. He was born in Poland, but then work was short in Poland, so the family moved to Russia when my dad was about three years old or so, St. Petersburg. And then he, he uh, came to Grand Rapids, uh, I think uh, he was uh, 18 or 19 years old. And, uh, and and uncle lived on Grand Avenue near Highland Park, and uh, he had uh, an uncle and uh, uncles and aunts in the same neighborhood. All the Polish people lived in one neighborhood, especially all the relatives. And my mother was born here. She was baptized at St. Adelbert's before they built St. Isidore's, and uh, she had a older brother was killed in World War One. He, uh, he wrote my mother a letter, he used to write my mother a letter and he wrote a letter and said, well, how is the family doing? And he said, most of the guys I was here with aren't here anymore. And he says, if the Huns don't get me, he says, I'll write you again in a couple of weeks. Well, the day before the armistice was signed, he was on a troop train and the German bombed a troop train and he got killed. And uh, then they offered to send my grandmother to France to see his grave and whatnot, but she just spoke Polish, didn't speak much English at the time, and she didn't have any desire to go, and they offered twice. And uh, so then uh, I guess they were going to offer about 300 and some dollars a month and paid, or a year I think, and paid in installments of three dollars and something. Uh, a month. <laughs> for the cemetery plot? You know, for a, like, you get paid, you, you have a son or daughter killed in battle, well then you get 10000 20000 well, at the time it was only about 300 and some dollars. Well then uh, she refused to go. Okay. And then my mother had a, uh, was a Notre Dame nun, just a little bit older, and, and she joined up the convent, and uh, she went to, Every church she, she went to Meckman, Wisconsin, and then she went to uh, St. Uh, Stanislaus in Milwaukee for 49 years. They transferred her to uh, uh, Michigan City, Indiana. Every church was a, a, a St. Stanislaus. Okay. And, and she, she lived, lived till she was about 95 or 96 years old. Wow. And, uh, so, so uh, you were born in Grand Rapids. What did your dad do for a living? Well, it, well, it was, it was during the Depression, and for quite a while, my dad and my grandpa and, and uh, worked at Burke and Gay Furniture, some of the other furniture companies. And my dad could take a piece of furniture and put a finish on it, just like glass. You know, just all, all the stuff was hand rubbed and everything else. Yeah. And uh, my grandpa was the same way. He was real meticulous, and uh, well. He used to always go fishing down to Reed Lake and get on a get on a bus and 
uh, like ice fishing, and then he'd come home and he'd mark it on a calendar how many fish he caught. Well, in 1940, he went fishing with a couple of neighbors. They had, they owned a grocery store on Harlan, and all the East Siders used to have, have a junk boats, and they it used to be called Cooster Lake, but now it's Middleborough Lake out here off Michigan. Well, then uh, they went fishing in August. They had their golden wedding anniversary uh, about a month or two early because uh, that was the only time my aunt that was not going to be there. And so then uh, they celebrated early. Well, then, anyhow, he stood up in a boat and tipped the boat over and they drowned in that lake there. So. Uh, Your dad did? No, my grandfather. Your grandfather? Yeah. Oh my! Romanowski, yeah. Oh, he oh, yeah. didn't know how to swim. No, well, he he uh, always dressed quite heavy, you know, with, with them clothes and stuff, and he might have suffered a heart attack while he. Oh, I know how they, they found him in a couple hours, but. Uh, wow. But uh, family was, was our whole family. Our whole family was into fishing. My, well, my okay. uncles, aunts, my mother, my mother go nuts over catching black bass and. <laughs> So how many brothers and sisters did you have? I had three sisters and one brother and my one brother died in 1972. He had like a silent heart attack as he went out, <clears throat> went out to put out the trash and came back and sat down in his chair and dropped dead. And then my sister, she was four years older than I was and, and uh, she and my dad and her three, they were children, were out riding around on a nice sunny day around some of the lakes around uh, uh, Big Wabasis Lake and uh, and uh, they happened to get to 10 Mile and and, and uh, what did that one begin to with R, Ram, Ramsdale and some guy ran, ran a stop sign and hit them and killed her and Pin her husband underneath the car, and my dad got thrown out. He didn't get hurt too bad, but then uh, one one daughter, I think she broke her leg. So, uh, so then that that's her, too bad. And her husband laid up for quite a while. Well, oh. Then uh, my uh, so. sister after that, she's she's still living. She just turned 88 this month, and then uh, I had a younger sister. Died uh, was about four years now, Dad. Five years. She had uh, cancer. And, uh, okay, so so you went to St. Isidore's for grade school. Yeah, ma'am. Then you told me you went to Catholic Central, and graduated in 1942. Um, then what happened? Did you get in, uh, drafted and enlisted? No, I I enlisted, but I I I was only I just turned 17, so. Uh, the government had a school they called the NYA School, National Youth Administration. I had a Monroe Avenue right across from the waterworks, you know, and I had a Monroe. Mm -hmm. They had a big building there, and they taught people how to welding courses and machine shop, and and so they had a lot of women working there, too. And uh, I, I know I worked with some Greek women up there, and I think one of them was a teacher. and, and Taught me a few years, a few words in Greek, because I was trying to pick up some language. So when I, <laughs> right after I got out of Great Lakes, and I, they sent me to school to Chicago, I stopped at some Greek restaurant in Chicago, and and uh, and uh, you sat down in a restaurant. And the guy come see what I wanted, and I said, "Well, take on us, take on us, Simra. How are you today? That's uh, how are you? Getting? How are you today?" And man, he threw his arms around me and started. Man, he thought us. I'm not Greek. I said, I'm not Greek. No, I think it's wonderful. I think it's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> but, so, you, so you graduated when you were 17. Yeah. You went to this this uh, uh, learning program yeah, on Monroe. And then, and then, then, uh, then what? Well, then, then, then we're still young, and then his friend and I went, and they had a machine shop where we were doing government work, so we worked on lathes on. 12 to 7 shift, and then shortly after that, I decided to go and try to get in, into the Navy. So I told them I didn't want to be drafted, I wanted to go right now. So they 
took me right then and there. Okay, and did you? gave me a choice, you know, to check you out, see how your health is. Can you see me? Are you breathing or something? Like that? Yeah, all right, you're, you're in. You're in. You're in. Uh, so you were 18 by then, or still 17? No, I just I just turned 18. Did you turned 18. I think, it, I think it was in uh, July when I went in. And where did you go for your basic training? Great Lakes, Illinois. Uh huh. And then. How how was that? How was your basic training? Oh, I liked it. They give you all the march every day and. But once in a while they tell you to put on a gas mask and throw you in a room and light off some of that gas and take your mask off and you're choking it. <laughs> Real gas? Oh, no, yeah, that must, uh, that tear, tear gas. Wow, uh, okay. Like, and uh, and they taught you about slowing the way you, you know, to tie your pant legs or get a sheet off your bed and you're supposed to throw it over your head and you're supposed to help you well, in case that gets sunk, but who's going to do that? But, uh, but then. Uh, what did you think about the discipline? Well, it didn't bother me. I thought I thought the I thought a round one sitting here somewhere with with our picture of the Great Lake. Okay. I set it down here. Okay, but but things went okay at basic. You you didn't uh, you weren't homesick or you didn't. No, no, I. I, I was doing fine. I, I tried to sign up for a tail gunner on a torpedo plane, and and uh, they take it a certain age, and then once that, you, if you want to go on a PT boat, you had to be 19 or something like that. But uh, but that was after you, after you graduated. But they get on Lake Michigan and do different things, and anyhow, after I. Uh, so they wouldn't let you be a gunner. So no, no. What they, did they train you for? Well, they didn't really train us for anything at Gray Lake. But then we, once we got graduated, well, then they sent me to Chicago for like a, a diesel, be a diesel mechanic for I don't know maybe half a dozen weeks, just certain things. Well, then when I was in Chicago, I used to go up and. See my aunt, uh, just a uh, hop, skipping away. But then uh, I uh, stayed up at Polish halls one night till they closed up, and it was cold outside. And I had to wait till the church opened up in the morning. Well, I went to the six o'clock mass to keep warm. Well, then my aunt didn't come down for the eight o'clock mass. Still didn't come down, and she came down for the eleven o'clock mass, and she says. Boy, the nuns were telling me what a religious nephew I had. He sat through three masses. <laughs> I told her, I told her I wasn't religious. I could try to keep warm. <laughs> she, she had a she had a good sense of humor. <laughs> That's nice. Um, so okay. they, did they they test you to th to find out what you would be good at? Well, yeah, they uh, <clears throat> they uh, uh, when when we got done with that school in Chicago, then they said, no, nobody's got to go in the amphibious force, all the only landing craft. Well, it turned out everybody went. Oh. And then, so then we ended up going to Little Creek, Virginia, uh -huh. and then they got, had all these landing craft, and every morning we'd have to get up and start them up and go out on Chesapeake Bay and, and do different maneuvers, but half the time half of them wouldn't start anyway. and. Uh, so uh, we had that for, I don't know, six, eight weeks, and then they sent us to Fort Pierce, Florida for advanced training. So then we had more training down, down there, and uh, they uh, waited, and then uh, after that training, they sent us to Panama City, Florida, to wait for our ship. Well, then as soon as the ship came down to Mississippi River, and then we went to New Orleans and picked up our ship in New Orleans, and then we did some training around there, and uh, I think I had on one of the slips telling you just about what we did, and, and then uh, after that training, well, then they loaded us up and went up the Atlantic coast, I think, 
forget. I don't. I don't want to cheat here to tell exactly what we did. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, I think it says on retro, in retrospect up there or something there. I think. Anyhow, we went by way of Nova Scotia. They used to send a lot of convoys that way. And uh, then we around towards Iceland. Well, then on the sixth of of, uh, of uh, April. I was, a, I was an engineer down in the engine room and I was on watch at about 5.30, uh, 2.30 in the morning. We had 40 ships in our convoy. Then all of a sudden we started hearing some explosions. So then we had a, they started general quarters and they had to run up to our station, gun station. Well, they, they torpedoed a ship on either side of us and they were both burning like crazy. And uh, we had a couple of British escorts, but they, I thought they said they got one, but that was pretty doubtful. Anyhow, you can't stop for anybody. That was on Helen's birthday, April 6th. I didn't know her at the time, but, uh, and uh, so. So, they, so did that make you guys all nervous? How, what was the reaction of the guys on ship? Well, they were in shock, you know, because that's quite a shock. All of a sudden, boom, 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 and you can't help anybody. And so. So you, by this time, you had been in the service for 10 months. They gave you about 10 months of training from yeah. June till April. Yeah. And then they put you, then well, they're sending you over to, to Europe. Well, 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 even, it was even June till, yeah, I'd say we left, we left, uh, left the States in March and we were in the middle of Atlantic in April. So nine or 10 months of, of yeah. um, and, uh, and then, uh, training. And then we went, uh, uh, Belmont, England, and then uh, and we generally operated on Weymouth and Portland and uh, Southampton and Plymouth, but mostly Weymouth and Portland. And uh, our ship made 42, 40, 40 or 42 trips back and forth between France and England. Okay. But uh, then. Uh, why? What were you doing? Forty-two trips. What were you doing? Well, doing some maneuvers. You know, practicing with uh, different la different landings and whatnot, and then practicing for the invasion of Normandy and, and moving supplies back and uh -huh. forth. Well, uh -huh. but then uh, we we're uh, up at Plymouth, England, and then we heard reports of some uh, LSTs being sunk. That was before the invasion. Well, as it happened, there were they were having some practice landing. The place they called Slapton Sands, England, just I think it's about north, north and east side of Plymouth. We were in Plymouth at Harbor at the time. Well, about up, the, they, they were loaded with 700 troops and 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 sailors combined, like in it. They're just. About two weeks before the invasion, they were practicing because they, the landings were basically the same type of shoreline and whatnot. Well, the Germans had these E boats, they called them, they're just like our PT boats. And they came in there while they're doing this practice and they destroyed these two, two LSDs. And there were over 700 and some uh, soldiers and sailors killed oh, before, they even, before they even got started. Oh, boy. But uh, but it, they kept they kept it a big secret. They they didn't want to tell anybody. And they I, I knew we had rumors and stuff. But I read up on it a lot and everything. And and even up to quite a few uh, years after the war was over, anybody spoke about it, they could get thrown in a, in, in a prison. I, I mean, uh, really. Uh, so so you felt that the the United States Army was filtering uh, the information that you received. Pardon? The the army was there. The the military was filtering what information you received about the progress of oh, the war. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. then, uh, but then they start loading up for D Day, and uh, they start moving all the. Uh, England looked it looked like it was going to sink. There's so much equipment to all the United States ships and. Tanks and, and guns and just loads and loads and loads. Well, they had to spread out all over England and and uh, English had these 
Spitfire planes and they could take off at a short distance. Sometimes you'd be going by some park and all of a sudden bang, they'd come up on the ground practically and they'd get information that the Germans were coming with their bombers. Yeah, and, yeah. And then uh, they uh, uh, finally decided, they, they tried to make up their mind when, when they wanted to go. The, the weather was supposed to be lousy. Well, they kept, this one English weather forecaster kept saying, you know, Eisenhower kept questioning him all the time, and uh, he said that uh, he thought maybe about the first part of June might be all right. Well, it turned out they loaded, had the ships all loaded, and they started going on their way, and then all of a sudden they got reports the weather was going to get bad, so they turned them around right away, and that was quite a maneuver, all this 5,000 ships. Well, then they were still on board the ships, and they said, well, you're going to have a go for uh, the sick because the weather beat eight, nine hours of good weather. So after that, it's going to be bad, bad weather. So away we went. Well, then got to go across the channel. So you knew you knew it was the real thing now. Oh, yeah, yeah definitely. Mm -hmm. Man, they, mm -hmm. they, it, was, it was quite a sight that the biggest armada they ever had or ever will have. Battleship destroyers, every kind of ship would float and like I said we carried about 25 of those tanks on board our ship and trucks on top and, and soldiers going in. Anyhow, <clears throat> early in, like I said early in the morning, real early, they got us all together on the 6th, on the 6th and fed us breakfast and then after a while they had everybody on the deck and the priest had a mask. Anybody want to go, no matter what, Catholic or whatever, and uh, so then after that we loaded up our boats. We had about thirty some guys on a boat, and uh, then we lowered, lowered these. Well, I don't know if they have them here. They lowered them down in the water and unhook them, and then we had a rendezvous area like from other ships too, and they had us going around and around in a circle, and then when they get the go ahead, well then they straighten out and go like a bat out of heck for shore as fast as you could and then when you hit the hit the shore you're supposed to drop your ramp and they would run off but then sometimes they you, know, you hit a sandbar and you, they thought it'd be shallow water and they'd step off and them guys had like 70 pound backs, uh, packs on their back and half of them drowned before they even got to shore. And then Germans had that all zeroed in on, on us otherwise and because they knew we were coming and so they, a lot of the guys got killed before they went to shore either. Body parts flying all over and uh, and uh, said they, uh, they uh, we, we got off the, we got off the ship then the small boat crews and we Stayed, stayed on Omaha Beach for about a month after that unloading ships and whatnot. And about the 19th of uh, June, then they had a terrible storm in the West when they had in years and years. If they had it during the invasion, it would have never come off. Well, anyhow, they, they lost more boats and ships during that storm than they did during the invasion, threw everything up on the beach and whatnot. And we had to go out. And, Pick up some officer one, one, one time they wanted to go out in their boat and man and wait about 30 feet high and get alongside the boat one minute he'd be up here or be down there and go like up and down all the we had the openings in there for the machine gun we didn't have it in there at the time and because of wavy we had him covered up with raincoats on he he jumped one time trying to get on her and he he thought it was solid and he went right through like a dog through a hoop <laughs> But, but any, Let, let's backtrack a little bit. So you are on the LST 533. Correct. Tell us what is an LST? Pardon? What does LST stand for? Large slow target. Okay. And so, seriously, large slow tr target. Yeah, well, it's what the <laughs> landing ship tank. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so then, but then there's all these, um, you, you, go over that part again. So how many tanks were on it? 
25. 25 tanks. How many sh little boats? We, we carried we carried six on our ship. Most of the ships that either had two or four, but then they, I got. Here's your picture right here. Here it is. And 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 um, how big boats were those? How many did it carry? Right, right there. Uh huh. They uh huh. They carried about I think it was about 32 guys with all their equipment, and then four of us. Okay. But they're made out of made out of plywood. Oh. And the ramp was steel, but I mean, it did nothing to stop the bulls when they started hitting that plywood. They had, did hire very little armor on them. Mm -hmm. Well, meant when we went in, their chairman had like pieces of angle iron they expected an uh, invasion. Well, then they were about like this, and down here, and then they had mines on top of that. So when you go in or hit one of the mines, it'd blow up. Well, that they had they had that done for for quite a few years because they expected it was just. There's hundreds and hundreds of them. And so, right, it was all booby trapped. Yeah, and they, well, then they had some of these Navy SEALs like go in there earlier and try to clear a path so you could get in there. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. then uh, some of these some of these landing craft got in the wrong place, like we were on Omaha Beach and the be they had beaches like Easy Red and this and that. And the beach we were on, they had. The most casualty they had about two thousand people killed there the first day, and uh, it and it, many holly, and then uh, you've probably seen pictures they were you see these guys hiding trying to hide behind these, and uh, they had uh, that Robert Capra he was a writer or photographer, for I think Life magazine or something. Else. He landed with, with the guys and and he. Uh, took movies of the invasion. Well, he took about a hundred, I think it was about a hundred and thirty some pictures, and then he was in hurry to get them developed. So he went back to England right away, and then he, they hurried up the photographer. Well, then they heated it up, the film too much, and he got very little. I think maybe although that he took maybe about. 30, 40 pictures out of the 100 and some pictures, so oh. that's why you never saw that many on the invasion. Yeah. What was your job um, specifically, Al? Did you Were you in a tank? Were you back on the ship? Where were you? I, I was on these landing craft, and, and uh, I, was, I was the engineer. I had a tent to the motor. Okay, but, on the big ship, on the LST? On both. We, if, we weren't on the, if we weren't on these little landing craft landing, well, then... We were on the LST down in the engine in the engine room. Okay. And we had we had like about six uh, six crews uh, for these LSTs, and then we still worked with regular like we we're in a regular attached to the ship, but uh, we stand watches in the engine room and whatnot. And, but uh, but but these guys that are coming off your ship are army. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so the Navy is taking care of the ship. Oh, definitely. Okay, okay, so you weren't up on the beach shooting anybody? You weren't on the beach? I was on the beach, but I wasn't shooting anybody. We. You were taking care of the boat? Yeah, we, we got off the ship and then we're getting supplies in there as quick as we could. And we we're bringing the guys in there, a lot of them guys would, a lot of them boats would get hit and then they'd start sinking and they didn't want you to try to save anybody. A lot of guys did, so they had, they had one guy had one boat. I think it was the first one that was brand new. That I forget what it was. It wasn't an LST, but right that first party invasion got blown up, and I don't know, 20, 30 guys got blown up with it and sunk, and I never, never saw anything like it. And then they had these big battleships ahead of us, the Texas and. Uh, uh, Arkansas and and uh, I forget what the other, what the cruiser was and uh, the, the the cruiser was Augusta and they had that they had uh, generals on there that were directing the invasion and uh, man the battleships will open up and you just feel the whole thing shaking and shaking but wow. but then they had another screw up they somebody I think the British had a 
bright idea to take these some of these tanks and they put a uh, just like put an inner tube around around them so they would float made out of canvas and they figured if they let them out away from shore they could come under their own power they want to get them on shore as fast as they could and had about 20 something I think they only had about two minutes the rest of them sank before they even got to shore so then that was some more uh, you know guns that they weren't able to cover the guys with but uh, they said they didn't have the communication like we got today they had right. walkie talkies and stuff like that well they had one, this one tank got to shore and then he was shooting it at something and these uh, destroyers are coming around and and they saw him where he was shooting finally he got some signal that he was pointing on something so the destroyers would come in and some of them came so close that they almost were hitting the ground that was for them they said he, the invasion probably would have would have been a failure so they start shooting where he start point pointing to them and mm -hmm. And, uh, so, so did you have time to stop and look at the whole scene? Oh, I, I mean, how would you describe it? There's all chaos bodies laying all over. And I, I was always telling them there was always one one uh, guy that was buried in his head and all his legs were sticking up about up to here. And uh, every time the tide would go out, then you'd see his body for about a week before they finally pulled him out. Oh, and, boy. and then I got a, I got a chance to walk around her more than a lot of the other guys would because on shore then and and you see these uh, different different landing craft and whatnot that all blown up and the guys all their possessions scattered all over family pictures and stuff like that and, you know just wonder somebody's father somebody's husband you know it's terrible but. Uh, just awful. So, so then, how long did this go on? I mean, did you, um, did you get any sleep um, during all this, or how long were you awake? Well, probably almost twenty-four hours a day. You just kept going, going till they just going, going. At one, at one point, at one point, they sent a message to Eisenhower. They didn't know if they were going to be able to land on on our beach at all because it wasn't so bad. They couldn't get a foothold in there. And, and uh, Eisenhower wrote two letters, one saying that it was his fault and that we're going to have to withdraw, and, and another one saying, well, that they're probably making a land landing, so then he said, well, we're gonna, finally going to land. But, uh, but uh, I said, then I finally got to go up on, on top of Omaha Beach. We stayed with the Army for a while. And, Two of us slept in one pup tent, and they didn't have any little cans of soup, and they'd have a wick in them about like like a side of a hot dog or something, and fit down on the inside and take that cap off, and had a little wick just like a candle, then you'd light it up, and that soup would get real hot in a hurry. But you had to you had to punch a hole in the can first, otherwise it would blow up, and the guy I was with him didn't punch a hole in it, and thing thing blew up and. Soup all over the inside. <laughs> Crazy. But, so, um, was that the best thing you had to eat, or were you eating? Oh no, we had, we had those K rations and C rations. Yeah. And, and uh, I like the C ration better than but but. Uh, Tell me the difference between a C ration and a K uh, ration. K ration, they had like more cheese and crackers and 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 put powder in water for making. Uh, Kool Aid or some darn thing, and and they had toilet paper, and they had some uh, what was that they came up with at the time that one uh, powder that they sprinkle on their wounds uh, uh, and uh, on their wounds to keep infection yeah, at bay. Yeah, uh -huh. I forget what they come. I begin with an S. I, I forget what, it, but it's real common now. But. Uh, and then sea rations had more like some vegetable, like a hash, vegetable hash or something like that. Okay. But, okay. Uh, I yeah. But then when we're out, when we're out on our boat, they always used to have a lot of uh, spam, and uh, don't take your tongue out. <laughs> Did you like the spam? Was that good? Uh, I I liked that they, they, uh -huh. had, they had 
they had spam and they had uh, always have gallons of fruit cocktail and stuff like that. So we ride around in our boat with a loaf of bread and a gallon of fruit cocktail and spam and eat what we wanted while we were working. Uh -huh. But uh, but then uh, I said we we got a ship that one time brought back. 700 and some German printers on our tank deck and and uh, took them over to England and they're all different nationalities. Some spoke Polish English, they had they printer they made fight with the Germans and uh, and the tank deck that big it could hold like uh, three railroad cars, like you know, like regular railroad cars and an en engine it was that big well then and they put them on her and they had like big canvas bags, like water bags, they had a spigot on them and I know I had to go down there one time among them all and fill up them canvas bags and but uh, oh, they were pretty well beat then and then they just had like they called like scuffers along the deck where it was just curb like and they had to use that for a bathroom and all till they got uh, back to England so then we just flushed that all out with a fire hose. But then another time we had 18 Polish nurses that were prisoners of the war and I think about 300 soldiers had been in the prison camp and were taking them back to England and I was the only one on board could speak Polish and so I go talk to the nurses and they said, thought I was in the Polish Navy. I said, no, I'm not Polish Navy, I was in American, American Navy. Well, you speak Polish. I said, I brought up Polish, went to Polish school, they always had to do a class and yeah. Well, they said that surprised him. Oh, oh yeah, then, yeah, yeah, yeah. Then, then, then a guy would say to me, "Fix me up with that one." You fix me up with that one, and yeah, I'd say it in Polish. Well, it's almost like <laughs> was a, was a very nice guy, you know, <laughs> and uh, related to a mule. <laughs> uh huh. Uh huh. <laughs> they call him <it> Cash. <laughs> And he said, you fix me up with that one? Yeah, I said, I fix you up, you know. Right, and then, silly. Then I was, they had numbers tattooed on their arms. They went to the lot and then I was sitting at the lunch table and talking to them when we were speaking in Polish and, and uh, all of a sudden this one guy came up to us and said, I sat down and then she said to me in Polish, well, is he Polish too? I says, no, he's a mimic, you know, mimic and Polish is German, you know. The man, she reached across the table and started choking him. She thought he was regular German and started shaking him. And I, I said, no, no, no. I said, he's American. He's American, you know. His father was just German. <laughs> no, they, they went through so much, you know, that they... Right, right. Hated the Germans. Oh, but, yeah, no, yeah. But, um, so you said you stayed on Omaha Beach then for but, about a month yeah, after the invasion? You know what? Then what did you do? Then what? Then we got on a Liberty ship and man, that was a pile of junk. The bunks were about six high and you could hardly breathe in a darn thing. They, they used to build them Liberty ships over here in just a couple of days they could throw one together. But then they took us to England and then we back to our back to our ship and then just kept going back and forth and then Back and forth between England and, and Normandy? Yes. And uh, And France? Yeah, like we 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 work out of out of uh, Weymouth and Portland most of the time, but then work out of Plymouth. So, like I saw, they had a big area about as big as room the Plymouth Rock, where the Pilgrims sail on the Mayflower, or mm -hmm. Sir Francis Drake sail around the world, and I was in a lot of history and stuff. And, did you, did you have some free time, Al, to look well, around? Oh, I uh, went, I got up to London twice and uh, got to see Westminster Abbey and St. Paul's Cathedral and Coronation Chair and where the changing of the guard where the Queen and King lived and uh, then about that time was, there she goes your dog, about that time they had these the bombs, uh, missiles that the Germans were fighting, they got the, the, uh, able to shoot these missiles and then they, especially over London and You'd see them coming over, and they just like they weren't going real fast. Just like you see a trail of fire, like they're burning something, and all of a sudden they go down there, and then wherever they stop, and they blew all kinds of stuff up. And I said, 
English people had a lot of fortitude, man. They didn't let nothing bother them that much. They come up by their uh, cellars and stuff like that, and pretty, first thing they do is get setting up a pot of tea first. But I mean, they're they're real real good fighters and mm -hmm. sailors. They 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 go to hell for you. Right. Right. So, did you get to know any of the English people? Oh, yeah, I, I know quite a few of them, and, mm -hmm. and uh, we all go to all them English pubs. They had a real good ale. And <laughs> that was fun. <laughs> oh, yeah, man. They, we, we always go in there just about the time they're ready to close up. They say, time, gentlemen, you know, so we order about a dozen beers and set them on a table. <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, but but all the time your your bunk you're actually living on the ship on the Liberty. Yeah. Well, well, if we went up to London and we'd have a couple, but like a weekend pass or something mm -hmm. like that. Otherwise, yeah, we'd be living on the ship, and mm -hmm. then we, while the, we're getting loaded up again and get back, and then we're on our way again. Mm -hmm. And like mm -hmm. it was a uh, Christmas Christmas Day of '44, we uh. Had to go up this sitting that was about the time they had the Battle of the Bulge. We had to take, go up the Seine River, go through the Harvard and up the Seine River. Your LST would fit or the Liberty fit up the the Seine? Pardon? What, would she, were you on the Liberty when you went up the Seine? No, we would we no, we we were back working at uh, we're, what? we were back from Liberty and then we had a, we came back from England to France and then we Come up the Seine River, it, 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 you take the port of La Harve and you follow that up and and you go to the town of Rouen, mm -hmm. about 15, 20 miles up. Well, then we, we had a standby with our guns all the time going up that river. Yet, that's about the time the Battle of the Bulge, so that had to go take supplies up that way. I see. And they had, they had a big, beautiful cathedral up there, and they. they, they didn't really bomb too much of it, but the people up there were so desperate for uh, toothpaste and and soap and incidentals and stuff like that, man. Mm -hmm. So we swap them stuff like that for cognac and Calvados <laughs> <laughs> for liquor. <laughs> they were glad to see you. Oh yeah, more than more than glad. It, it, uh huh. It, but uh, oh. It, yeah, it got kind of, kind of strange one time when, I, I think it was around, I think it was around Bayou, down in Bayou shortly after they liberated us, I'm, I'm sure there, and there was all these black troops standing around there, and you used to hear them talk English, and all of a sudden they're all talking in some language I never heard, and well, they, they were from French Guiana, I guess, like that, and you know, you, you think you can talk about black people with a southern accent, and then all of a sudden you don't understand anybody. <laughs> right, right, right. So um, the whole thing was um, kind of a learning experience for you, um, seeing your some of Europe and, and. Oh yeah, definitely. I, mm -hmm. Man, I'd pay for everything, all your food and lodging. And <laughs> it's a good deal, huh? And did you did you correspond a lot with your family? Oh yeah, when the, right after the invasion, I think it might have been the next day, they used to have these email envelopes and you could write a message on there and then charge it and then and they let us send a message home telling the parents while we were successful landing and so we're in France now, so at least they knew where we were and what we were doing. Mm -hmm. But uh, mm -hmm. but then uh, no, I I really enjoyed England. I said the people could have been nicer. I got to see a lot of historical places, and uh, but uh, I can't say I was terrified because some I was always into this adventure stuff. When I when we were going across from Grand, uh, United States to England, what was I doing? I was reading the sea story, Captain Horatio Hornblower, uh, English sea captain. <laughs> so did you feel like you were fortunate in that decision to join the Navy? Oh, definitely. But, 
I mean, even though you were in danger, yeah, you weren't in as much danger as you could have been. Well, well you're in danger no matter what, what Navy, you're, Army, or yeah. Marines, but, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, my, my family always liked fishing. I was always around the water all the time I was a kid, so I figured, well, I liked that too. But uh, So that's why you chose the Navy? It <laughs> was a good decision. <laughs> oh, yeah, but uh, no, I, we had a nice bunch of guys from all over the country, a lot of from Minnesota and down south, and everybody, a lot of them from around New York, and mm -hmm. everybody got along real well. And, That's nice. And we had a good good crew and a good captain. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, one time, though, he had these boats, and you're supposed to, on ship, you're supposed to have them pointing toward the bow while you're going, and somebody screwed up and pointed it, put one up backwards, and he goes, what the hell are you thinking? The damn Chinese Navy take that damn thing <laughs> up right. <laughs> so, um, so was there um, a lot of smoking and drinking, or playing cards on ship before you got there, or what oh, did you do? Oh, a lot of a lot of guys gamble all the time, and uh -huh. man, they get their they get their pay, and then first thing you know, they're shooting craps or cards, and and then. About an hour later, one of them can borrow 50 cents. I want to go on liberty. <laughs> I never, I never lost any money. I never got into that gambling stuff. But mm -hmm. oh, yeah, mm -hmm. he, I read about one guy. I think he was in the army, and he was going through the invasion, and all of a sudden he was shooting craps, and he was making money. I guess he got up over two thousand dollars, and and then. <laughs> Didn't know he when to quit. He figured, I'd probably never live to spend it anyhow, so he went and he blew it all before he went. So before you went over to Europe, you got to come home and visit um, on furlough before you left? Yeah, we, we uh, when I got back, I, I think I had a short trip. I'll tell you another crazy thing. Uh-huh. <laughs> Used to go, used to have a train station downtown. That I think it was like a Union Station. Of, yeah. where you get the trains there, and, and that's right. I was, I was home on leave, and uh, went to get on a train, and so I jumped on a train. We we're, were down in uh, New York, and uh, start. Guy going on a train ways, and pretty soon, next stop is what was it in Canada? <laughs> <laughs> Canada was supposed to be on a Pennsylvania train at New York. <laughs> what am I? What am I going to do? And he says, "Well, I talked to the conductor. Oh, well, we can take it as far as Buffalo, New York, then you can get on the right train." Well, then I happened to be riding with some woman who was a Canadian Army, so she, uh, <laughs> she had to have a bottle of Canadian whiskey along with it. <laughs> so I had a pretty good trip. That's good. That's good. So uh, I see you weren't discharged until March of 1946. Right. So what did you do? I mean, so that's, you continued to, to bring supplies to the interior of France oh, yeah, we, for the rest of well, your... Well, we, we came back to the, we came back to the States. And uh, right after, right after uh, the war was over, and and Europe, mm -hmm. we came, came back. I think about the end of uh, end of May, and and then uh, we're, we, the war was still going on in, in the Pacific. Well, then I think we're in Providence, Rhode Island, and we're supposed to get a Christmas leave. And then all of a sudden they canceled our Christmas leave, and they. So you got to take a load of stuff down to Florida, and everybody's madder than heck. And so then we took off, and then we got out of, about four hours out of New York. All of a sudden we had a bad storm, and that thing going like this, like this. They recently had seven cracks going across the deck before it started to fall apart. So then they had closed off all the compartments. And one guy, he's taking all this stuff out of his 
the locker and put it in his bag and where do you think you're going? <laughs> Somebody else went, sink, sink, you want to survive, at least sink, we want to survive. <laughs> survive, really, now you're going <laughs> you, you to live in that water, you know. They had all the compartments closed off and then put a, sent it on SOS and we made it back into New York. So then we're in, in dry dock in New York, so then we did get to have our Christmas leave. Well then, this gave half of them Christmas leave and the other half we were going to get leave for New Year's. Well, I had Christmas leave and I got back and I, I was in, we're, we're just about half a dozen blocks away from Times Square in New York. And I, I, I was in charge of one section and they said, I think I think Christmas Eve was on a Saturday then. You, you want Saturday or you want Sunday? I thought, well, Saturday just just overnight Sunday we didn't have a lot longer leave. I said, well, I'll take Sunday. We'll, we'll work we'll work Saturday. Turned out Saturday was New Year's Eve. Here we're sick and sitting on board ship and hearing all this stuff going on. Time for I screwed up. <laughs> <laughs> I bet they were mad at you. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, uh, but, so, um, but, how did your? But, but, but then we. Our ship was in, in, in dried out there while they were fixing it. Well, then we spent all that time in New York. Well, then they were fixing our ship to go to the Pacific, camouflaging it and changing this and changing that. Well, then they gave us a 30 day leave. I think it was September, was it? In 45. September of 45. No, 46, uh, 40, 45, yeah. yeah. And uh, the last, last day of my leave was uh, they dropped the atomic bomb in Japan surrendered. So, man, everybody running down, down, down on Monroe Avenue, everybody running around celebrating and everything. And, and uh, so, so then we got back and everybody thought they were going to get out right away, but they had like a point system you got so many points, you get home early. Well, then I think it was in March, uh, we're in New Jersey, and so I got off the ship in New, uh, New Jersey, and uh, Bayonne, New Jersey, and then the Great Lakes, and then they gave us a discharge. And, and this one friend of mine, I was going to take the train home, and he, and he lived in South Bend and ride the train back and well I stopped down to my house and was was celebrating I drop you off at the bus station and while well, we celebrated all night and he had an old nineteen twenty nine Studebaker and all of a sudden tried to pass a <laughs> bus station. I'm taking you to Grand Rapids and Grand Rapids heck I let me off at the bus station, he's half bombed anyway. <laughs> Got to come, come, come out of Indiana, and he didn't know which way to go. And also, some police car sent there to chase the police car. I want to know what, which way to Grand Rapids. So, <laughs> drive to Grand Rapids, and all of a sudden, he ran out of gas. Here was, I don't know, it's about three, four o'clock in the morning. Here we're pushing this car, going towards Kalamazoo, <laughs> finally. <laughs> Finally, we found one place that opened and gave us a little gas and then go in the gas station. Here we had our dress clothes on and, and uh, this, had trouble with the car, so we get down we get down in the grease pit and he takes it apart and he puts cardboard in, in the bearings and just, they're, they're generally like uh, brass or whatnot. Put, put that all together and he takes off or going back home and I'm hitchhiking back to Grand Rapids. <laughs> what a mess! <laughs> I think he made. I think he made it almost to the end of border before he finally gave up. <laughs> what were your parents' reactions when they saw you at the door? Well, they're real happy. I don't know why, but <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Everybody was celebrating. You know, when, when that war started, I was an entirely different man. As soon as that war started. <laughs> Everybody's running, running to sign up, 
and uh, people are bringing all their pots and pans and silverware and stuff, metal, everything metals and stuff, and, and get the cooking grease and stuff because they use that for explosive and everything, and they're rationing off your clothes and gasoline, you get maybe about three gallons a week, and then rationing off the milk and coffee and all that stuff, and people were more than willing to put up with all that stuff. And my my sister and my dad uh, worked at Will Run building those B-24 Liberators. Did they? And uh, then they get home maybe once about every three weeks or so. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and, and mm -hmm. a, lot, a lot of relatives were all getting into the service. I know I'm, my dad had one cousin killed near right at the beginning of the war. Then one of the kids that I knew, he was on a destroyer out in the Atlantic, and he got washed overboard. And another kid I knew lived about a block down the street. He was an only child, and he got some kind of cruiser Houston in the Pacific. But uh, they, they, wow. used have, they used to have a whole list down of St. Ezra, all the people in the service, and yeah. you know, they got killed. And, but, yeah. uh, what would you say the lasting effects of the war were on you, Al? Well, I know, I know that people were willing to give up a lot of stuff to help each other out. I mean, right, right after the war, well, things started to get better and the work improved and everything like that. And uh, but uh, I know we've been through the depression. We uh, we were on welfare, man. That you might you came off the bell line. You know where Saint Edward is. My dad helped build that belt line years back. He'd walk up there every day and push a wheel. They didn't have all this machinery. They'd build it by, a lot of it by hand. Mm -hmm. Come back all covered with cement dust and everything for maybe dollar, two dollars a day. And then they'd have these visiting ladies. If you wanted your kid to have a pair of pants or dress or something like that, they'd quiz you like you were some criminal or something. You know, do you, you really need this? You really need that? And, mm -hmm. But uh, Mm -hmm. We used to get a lot, we ate pretty good. We used to get a lot. Helen's dad used to work with the welfare department. He used to help deliver wood to these people. And he, had, he ran a wood yard, and then he'd, where, where the hotel is on Ann Street. Mm -hmm. And they'd get all these wood when they'd cut down trees and stuff, and all he'd be in charge of that and get these prisoners out of jail and cut wood and deliver it here and there. And uh, mm -hmm. But, uh, we, we used to get a lot, we used to get grape jam and jelly gallon cans, and they used to get potted beef and cans like that. We used to get a lot of rice, a lot of beans, and we used to get tickets for a couple of milk, gallon of milk, something you get mm -hmm. made three a week or something like mm -hmm. that. And, uh, but yeah. our, our parents knew how to cook. Right. Everybody knew how to cook in them days. and uh, we Stretch, never, we stretch the thought. money. Yeah, I'm going to have to stop it there. It's June 5th, 2015. I'm interviewing Al Kowaleski at his home in Grand Rapids, Michigan. This is Deb Moore of the Veterans History Project from Grand Valley State University. This is take two. Um, so so um, getting back to that question, um, how do you think the war affected your life? Oh, I I mean, did did you grow up? Did you learn what kind of things did you learn from your experiences? How did it change you? Uh, How did it change I, you? I wasn't as scared of hard work. I know I <clears throat> I worked all the time when I was a kid. I was going to Catholic Central. And mm -hmm. I used to run from home all the way to Catholic Central and back, and come back home and there's a you know where the Red Cross is here and all well, they had. Three brothers had farms there, and he used to go work on that farm. He used to grow a lot of produce, beans and tomatoes, and a lot of rhubarb and stuff like berries. And sometimes we'd go out there and hoe in our berry patch for all day long for a dollar a day. Mm -hmm. he, used to, he used to pasture cows out there where the jail is now. Chase walk them to Belmont Edition. And, <laughs> and, uh, but uh, no, I found out that people, people
people helped each other, you know what I mean? Everybody was neighborly, everybody knew everybody else, but people don't, uh, people don't uh, be as neighborly as they used to be. You can live next, next door to people for years and never get together with them. Mm -hmm. Man, every, when I was a kid, all the relations always parties and weddings and stuff like that. And, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Man, we had about 300 people to our wedding, mm -hmm. and, uh, but... So did you, um, did you used to have, uh, bad dreams or nightmares after the war or anything, or were you always able to talk about it to people? Well, I, I was able to, I was able to talk about it, but for a long time when we first got married and stuff, people didn't, went back to, back to work with their families and stuff, people didn't talk about it that much. They, talk about it a lot more now. I mean, a lot of people couldn't talk about it. They, a lot of them had a lot more effect on them than it would me. Cause, mm -hmm. Like I said, I was always an adventure and used to see those Errol Flynn movies, you know, where they fly to Dawn Patrol and shoot at each other with, <laughs> with their guns. Right, <laughs> right, right. I, I, went, I went down, I went down to Panel in the hotel when I was 17, and they had a, 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 a air, airport recruiting office there, and I went down there, and I, I thought I wanted to be a pilot, and hell, I never really drove a car or nothing, <laughs> hardly a bike, and I, I took a four-hour test, and I passed the test, but, uh, but then, they said, well, your depth perception is off, and I said, well, there's nothing wrong with my eyes. They said, I was out partying last night. He said, well, well, we'll have to, we're at quota filled right now, so I went and got in the Navy, and then about two, three months after I got in the Navy, they sent me as, as accepted for the Air Force, but after a while, I was glad I did, because them guys were getting killed left and right. Them, then plays that go down to see, like that books and books for and B-17 bombers and stuff. They go on maybe a hundred on the mission, and maybe half of them were lucky to come back and yeah. Yeah. and uh, yeah. didn't didn't have much chance of you know mm -hmm. getting through. But mm -hmm. uh, well, well, tell me now. Um, your son Dan wants us to be sure to include the monkey story. What's that mean? <laughs> When when I was work, when I was working on Omaha Beach, I said we we sleep. On, they had some ship and we'd sleep on the ship while we're because we we didn't sleep on them little boats, and we, we had the bunks on there. And the, the guy that had the bunk above me had a pet monkey had it had it tied tied in his bed and my. I, I was sleeping right below, and he was out on a job working somewhere. And I come in there trying to get to sleep, and man, that monkey was re raising so darn much, chain screeching and howling and everything. I couldn't get any sleep, so I finally well, took that monkey and I took it in bed with me and covered it up like a little baby. And the, mo the monkey went to sleep, and I didn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, funny. And I used to tell the kids when they went to school, I said, well, the moral is this story is don't monkey around. <laughs> that is funny. And, well, they, 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 did, they did that when, I, when they were taping me on Channel 3 and whatnot, and they, they, they went and used that, and they thought it was awful funny. Did they? <laughs> so my, my great, my great granddaughter had, she goes, she goes to school up here at, uh, uh, Northfield? Northfield, yeah. Uh -huh. and, uh, and she's in the third grade. So just the other day before yesterday or so, they had North, uh, had uh, tell stories in school and she told that monkey story in class. <laughs> <laughs> Funny. Did you use the GI Bill when you came back? Not really, no. I, I went to. I went right to work. I, I met my future wife. And, uh, I, uh, I worked right. They had uh, metal craft 
they used to make automobile, automobile parts right before Van Andel Arena is beyond Ionia there. And I worked there for a couple of years and I had a chance of getting the post office and I was at, at about a year but they weren't, weren't doing too much and I used to drive all them old mail trucks with no heat in them or nothing, no brakes on them and all that stuff and then I tried a couple other places and then I uh, I did machineries that one time and used to work two weeks days and two weeks nights and got tired of that one. And then there's this one Polish guy who's quite a bit older than I was one of the neighbors and he used to think that was big stuff. He'd go uh, he was in the in the navy too and get get these uh so much a week and if you go to somebody's outings for a week or so to camp while well, you get paid too and he thought that was easy money. Well then when they started the Korean War, all of a sudden, and they called him up because he was in Naval Reserve here. He was about 30 some years old. <laughs> about, about a week he was in church, he was wearing his Navy uniform. He, he didn't think it was so great then. Boy, he was in there for a couple of months, then he got out and no, no more reason. <laughs> that was it, huh? That was it. Okay. Did you ever join any veterans groups? Yeah, I belonged to the Legion there for a while with my dad and my brother-in-law, but then I got busy around the house and I didn't have time raising the kids and doing this and doing that. And so I got out of it for a while. Then when I was in, after a while, I didn't think too much of it. I'd invite somebody there for a speaker or something like that, and some official and some guy laying his head on a table falling asleep. And, 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 and I didn't think, think that much of it. Right. But then I, I joined again now I, I, at that boat canoe club for about the last four or five years. But What's I haven't gone to a meeting yet. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, Good. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not really a joiner. Okay, okay. We, we, don't, we, don't, we don't have time around here to do any volunteer work. Man, we're so darn busy around the house and babysit our grand, great grandkids. Like, like our, our one granddaughter, she she's a teacher but doesn't have a teaching job and, and she babysits kids or she goes down to Northview to first, second grade or something like that. She volunteers and teach a class for an hour or so. Oh, that's nice. So I go watch watch the great granddaughters and that's man, nice. they got me I'm nine years old and they got me dancing on the floor with them and they so <laughs> They throw their stuffed animals at me. And <laughs> That's nice. Uh, they're, they're a lot of, lot of fun. That's good. Okay, well, listen, thanks for talking to me, Al. I appreciate it. Yeah.